determine the client performance, cruise performance, uh, endurance range of fuel consumption. Oh, I think I forgot that. <coughs> I think I uh, determine the landing performance, discuss max glide, distance charge, crossing component chart, and then some aeronautical decision making. That is going to be sprinkled in throughout the discussion, though. But before we get into all that, homework. What was the homework I gave you guys on Tuesday? Part 93. Who did that? Who looked, who just actually did open it and at least looked at part the words part 93 in the race nice and high i want to see who you actually did all right who actually who those of you that did open it and look at the words who read some of the words okay go ahead so we can talk about some of this what is 14 cfr part 93 and how does it affect us you read some of the words in it what were some of the words special air traffic rules for operating in certain areas. Somebody's looking at the rig right now. <laughs> okay, good. So continue reading. Nice and loud for everyone else. Uh, so can begin. This part prescribes special air traffic rules for operating aircraft in certain areas described in this part, unless otherwise authorized by air traffic control. Which that would be called a part 93 deviation. Deviation approved. Unable part 93 deviation. These are things you're going to hear. That's by air traffic control, providing they're telling you you can deviate from the part 93 rule. Well, we'll find out where it's talking about us. Are we going to the Alaska Anchorage? Well, that's us. Yeah. Read off. The next part. Oh, the next part. So, 2 1. Applicability. Okay. This subpart prescribes the air traffic rules for the arrival of aircraft used for scheduled service. Oh, no, no. I went down to the Alaska part. Yeah, the Alaska part. Okay. Because it's going to talk about what's on the board right now. So that will be subpart D. Okay, Delta. This subpart prescribes special air traffic rules for aircraft operating in Anchorage, Alaska terminal area. Description of area. The Anchorage, Alaska terminal area is designated as the airspace extending upward from the surface to the upper limit of each of the segments described in subsection 93.55. Let me do something. Because I want everyone to see what we're talking about. <clears throat> you know what? I'm sorry. I, I hate that. Okay. Internet Explorer hates you. Good. It's mutual. <laughs> we're all in agreement then. All right, part 93. <clears throat> All right, in here. So we're going to go back to my slideshow real quick. What is up? What's the... Uh... So how does it affect us? Well, we have part 93 rules. There are segments, okay? What are those segments? The international segment. International. And then there's other little extra other stuff. Okay, so there are different segments. Where are we going to find information about this besides in the regs? What is going to give us further guidance? Yeah. What's the salmon book called? The chart supplement. All right. Now you got to know where to look in there, but if you go from cover to cover, you will find stuff where you recognize, oh, hey, there's Merrill Field. Oh, hey. There's another barrel field, all right? Just so happens, there may or may not be some uh, pictures in our slideshow here. All right, so back to our slide. What are the segments? Well, we just talked about. We have the International, we have the Lake Hood, we have the Merrill, the Elmendorf, the uh, Bryant, Seward, all right? What are some of the altitudes we're talking about here? What is the Merrill segment altitude restrictions? Find it in the regs if you've got it on you right now. You, if you have a salmon book, also you'll find it in there. Go ahead, man. Is it 600 feet? Up to 600? I'm sorry, say it. So 600 feet MSL and 2,000 feet MSL in that portion of the north. Can you operate in that range? Mm -hmm. 6,000 to 600 feet. 
Yeah, we are excluded from that range from 600 feet to 2,000 feet. We're excluded in that area. So if you're crossing the inlet, leaving Elmendorf, or I'm sorry, leaving Merrill, you're going north to the practice area, and you are not given a deviation, you have to remain below 600 feet or between what? Who's got the salmon book? Not 2,000. It's over 2,000. Yeah, yeah. Can I go above 25? Can I go above 25? I go above 25. Age 439 and 440. Segments and on the next page is your blocks. Okay. So, what do you have to if you're crossing the inlet from the Elmond or from the Merrill segment? What it's either below 600 or what's the other one that you're looking at? It. Nope. Correct. Okay, this is right then. Two, 2,200 to 2,500 is our, uh, the range we're supposed to be. That's in the regulations. 2,200 up to 2,500. That is where we cross. Now, why do we care about this? Why are we talking about Part 93 deviation or Part 93 itself? It well, definitely applies to us, but we're talking about performance. So why do we care about the regulations? Uh, you know, if you have the performance to be able to. Right. Well, to get to that point. Right. Because what else is in that book that you're going to have to request before you ever tax it? You need to let ATC know what kind of departure you want. What kind of departure procedure you're <laughs> going to use to remain compliant. So what are the departure procedures? What's the one that is uh, specifically made for us here at UA? We talked about them last time. Inlet departure. You will have your altitude, I guarantee it, by the time you're over Ninth Avenue Park. You'll be at your altitude. Damn near. Or over you'll, South Shoreline, you'll have your altitude. We'll go that far. It's not going to be any issue. You must be at the altitude by mid channel. Why mid channel? You are climbing out to the practice area and you look over your right wing. What are you looking down? Elmendorf's runway. Well, who's going to be flying right underneath you? I've got pictures of F 22s flying underneath me if you guys want to see them. C 17s, C 130s, all AUX. They're all they're going to be underneath you because they're on a final approach to Elmendorf. So that's why you have to have that altitude by mid channel because that's your approach point. You got to stay out of their way. You need to have enough vertical separation between you. So that we need performance, so we know what kind of departure we can request. So shoreline, straight out 25, and you climb all the way up to the shoreline, then you turn, once you hit the shoreline, you go straight towards Sleeper Strip. And you continue climbing until you hit your altitude. Ship Creek, you take off, you turn immediately towards Ship Creek, and you can, and you just climb, 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 and you hope you can make it. Right now, you can. If you pitch for something, what do you need to, this is where your calculations are going to come in. What kind of climb are you going to want to do? VX or VY? Yeah. Probably. What kind of climb are you going to want to do if you're on the inlet? VY. VY. So this is why we're talking about this, because this is a real world application to you as a student when you get ready to transition, because everyone here always does an inlet departure. It drives me nuts. Other countries, flights, you know, there are other speeds that we can fly this airplane at rather than 90 knots, which all students seem like they got a cruise at 90 knots on the practice area. Use this. 90 knots in the practice area, we're going over the inland, you're reducing throttle down to like 19. Like. How does aircraft performance affect our decision making? Well, we just talked about that. What kind of departure are we going to do? What kind of airspeed are we pitching for? What is the performance? What do we have and what can we do? All right, here's our segments, okay?
What is this right here? What point designates that right there? Kind of hard to read if you don't know what you're looking for. All right, so this is 2-5 here. Uh, this way, this is downtown over here. This is 7, so this is facing west, facing east. And uh, this would be 1-6 going this way and 3-4 going this way. This is Elmendorf. This is us. Uh, Ted's here, Lake Hood's over here. So we're, what would be here? What designates that spot? What? Ship Creek, the mouth of Ship Creek is a point that separates Elma North from us. It's the mouth of Ship Creek. You want to stay just to the south of Ship Creek. Your instructor should be able to see Ship Creek off the right side of the airplane as you're climbing out. In reverse coming in, they tell you to fly to Ship Creek and make right traffic runway 25. It should be off on your side. You should be able to look down on the left there and see Ship Creek. If you, are, if you can see Ship Creek coming in bound, if you're south of it, you're legal. What about here? Westchester Lagoon. All right. Westchester Lagoon separates us from Lake Hood. Now you go straight out. What's right here? You can almost read it right there. You've got Point McKenzie. So if that's Point McKenzie, what do you think's over here? Point No Name. Those are the two spots. That is our area. Point No Name to Point McKenzie, Ship Creek, Westchester Lagoon, and what is right in the middle? Sleeper strip. And that's what you aim for, and that's usually what you make a call out for. Now, something new that just I was just informed about today by ATC as I was climbing out is we usually call out, we're climbing out mid channel, headed to the practice area. They don't want to hear that anymore. They want a distance and a heading from. So, what they really want at you to say is two miles to the southeast of sleeper strip, heading to the practice area. Huh. Yeah, I wasn't the only one to get chewed out on the radio. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's your different segments, okay? You will hear them sometimes when you're picking up the weather here. Your A disco. Yes, sir. So on the right side, the airplane supply, like basically on the right side of the road, or they just sort of figure out where the other plane's going to be. Oh, so now you're getting into the regulations. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk about aircraft right away uh, in later blocks. Tim, so here's how it goes. You just have to avoid hitting the other airplane. The regulations will state that you want to pass each other on the right. But what if that person's offset to your right? Do you really want to turn to the right? No. What if that person makes a left-hand turn and you're making a right-hand turn? Hmm. Yeah. So it all depends. Yes, you want to try to make a right-hand turn, unless you should make a left-hand turn. <laughs> Use Remember, you are in three-dimensional airspace out there. There are other options. I've had to go up. And I've had to go down to avoid people. You have an escape on as well. Just always remember, there's one direction, so a hell of a lot easier to lose that. Very easy to lose altitude in these airplanes. A little harder to gain the altitude. So, um, all right. Uh, <clears throat> when you're picking up ATIS, sometimes you'll hear them talking about that Ted Stevens is taking off and to the on runway one, one seven. Avoid the sewer high segment. Avoid the sewer segment. That's what they're talking about. Because they're going this way, and they want you to be cautious of the weight turbulence. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff that you will hear that refers to this kind of this information. And here's our altitude blocks. So the anchorage segment starts at 2,000 and up and under 1,200. Elmendorf is, they are restricted to a 200 foot block. And that is for their final approach into runway um, six. All right. Yes, ma'am. So I was um, doing some late night reading on okay. that little paint colored book. Good. And I saw that like, you have to be 2,000 feet above any national park, which is like all of Alaska. You know what I'm saying? Because I read that somewhere. Because of like environmental concerns. That's not all of Alaska. Though. Yeah, but like you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah, it's a significant amount. Yeah. Those areas are way out there, and those parks are on the ground. 
thought those was requested. I thought they just and requested. You yeah, know. you gotta check the regs on that because it's not a requirement. Oh, it is. So no. it Where? Denali. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, everyone wants to go buzz around that. Anyway, yeah. One, I would not go near Denali in a little airplane. All the sightseers. The weather is very volatile and volatile. And the winds coming off of that mountain and around that mountain are dangerous. We don't have the power to get out of that. So, but um, yeah, you got to remember that's on the ground. Yeah, but like I was thinking, like, does it count if they're like large? Trees like a red leaf. Do you know what I'm talking about? No, I do, but we don't have that kind of stuff here. Okay. The trees aren't that big. And honestly, you're talking about 200 foot tall. Tree. Yeah. <laughs> it's really not that big. When you're flying at 2,500 feet, okay, so now you just got to fly 25 or 3,000 versus it's whatever. It really it doesn't make a difference. But it's not something you really need to worry about. Um, and the way the, the charts will tell you, there is actually on there, we'll tell you the different areas that are national parks so you know where you're at but um we'll talk about all that in the regs though okay we will dig into that in the regs. all right let's talk about some takeoff performance this is one of the charts this is the line chart that you're going to have to that you will potentially have to use depending on the aircraft you fly all right i've seen these for pipers this is from the diamond one all right who's ever used these before who's ever seen this before but you know how to use this really not a big deal. All right, yes, ma'am. They actually have something like that on the SAT Do they? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. Because I got <laughs> SATs one. have changed a lot since yeah. I went through. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those like cognitive things. Like, can you figure right. it out without knowing what you did? Okay. Well, can you figure this out? No, I got it no. wrong. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't well, understand. So, but they will try to help you out with this, okay? Because if you see here, there's an example of how to read this. And I pulled just a picture up. There is a sample problem that is that's associated with this picture in the POH. So, and all you're doing is you're starting out with your temperature. You got to figure out what the temperature is outside. On here, I think they're saying it looks, it's hard to read, 22 degrees maybe. So you take 22 up to the altitude. And you're going to go across. And you're going to follow the temperature or the weight, I'm sorry, the gross weight, yeah, gross weight down to where you're at. And you're gonna just kind of parallel the lines as they go down. So you hit where you're at, and you're gonna straight across, and this is gonna be a wind correction. Tailwind, headwind. And that's how that's read. And I wish I had a better picture because this is really difficult to read. All right, but you'll see, if you follow their lines, down to the weight that they are, over to the wind, down to the component of the headwind, and then you find out over here is the distance for your takeoff performance. It'll tell you how much runway you need for your takeoff. Cessnas, a lot easier. Again though, the nice thing with these ones, what do you not have to do with these? That I word that I used before, if anyone remembers what it Interpolate. is. Interpolate. Interpolate. What do you have to do on these ones? Interpolate. What if you're taking off? You know, if you're taking off at 500 feet, I, you know, you probably want to interpolate it anywhere in between there. See, level? we're at 137 feet. I would just go with the numbers on there. All right. But what if you're taking off and it's 15 degrees Celsius? 25 degrees Celsius. There's some interpolation that should be done. You will, because you will get problems like that on the test. And in real life, you want to know roughly what your performance is. The DP is going to want to know that you know how to calculate this out. <clears throat> what a little bit of really with our takeoff performance, okay? Say you're taking off from, a, from uh, Merrill here. It's five degrees outside, five degrees Celsius outside. What is your takeoff roll required? You guys know how to figure that out? Add the two numbers up. So five degrees Celsius, so it's in between. You're gonna add these two numbers and divide by two. That's how you find five degrees. So, have at it. C low. Yeah, we're taking off out of here, so we'll see low. 
892, so 893, just round up. I always, rule of thumb with distances is I always round up. I make it so I need more of something, typically. Um, all right, so 892, you said? 893? 893 feet. How old are our airplanes? Early 2000s? Um, I think Zero at Whiskey might be 98. I mean, so um, you think those things, what happens with the uh, engine over time? Oh, it degrades a lot. Yeah, even rebuilt engines aren't perfect, are they? No. Oh, no. So if these engines are 20 something years old, pushing 20 years old. Do you think you're going to get the performance in the book? Mm -hmm. So this is a risk management type of scenario. What would you do? Well, you know, we're taking off. It's five degrees outside. Why don't we just use the 10 degrees? Give ourselves a little extra space. Now, if you want to clear a 50 foot obstacle, you're saying, okay, maybe round that up to 1600 feet just to be easy. I require my 1600 feet. Now you know you've got plenty of space because you're going to at least have that performance more likely. So you want to take off on a greater than 1600 foot runway. I would not recommend taking off on a 1600 foot runway. But you know roughly where you're at and you have a good shot of it. You're taking into account the age of the engine, the weather, you might be, you're a little bit higher than sea level here, 137 feet, things like that. That's all part of the risk management. But that's how you interpolate that information, okay? So let's say you're taking off an airport at um, 7,200 feet and it's 27 degrees outside. So if I say, 7,200 and it's 27 degrees. It's the distance you're going to need. <laughs> Precise or rounding up with a cushion? You get to participate. Same question. I mean, you get to participate, you just don't have to answer it. Oh, yeah, I was going to answer. I was just asking them. Yes, ma'am. Are you there again? Okay. So you're going to take, <coughs> you got to start out at the altitude that we're at. So we're at 7,000 feet. Yeah. What do we have? It says 72. Do we have 72? Can we get 72? Can you get close to 72? Yeah. Like maybe 72,000 or 7,250? So what you're going to do is you're going to go. Now, the other problem is we have 27. Well, there's no 27. So you're going to have to do several of these. That's kind of a pain in the butt. So what you're going to do, though, is you will add, add two and divide by two. So you're going to add the two together and divide by two. So start with. What I would do is start with 30, 30 degrees, go down to 7,000 feet and 8,000 feet because you're going to want to get in between. So add those two together and divide by two. And the number you get, add to that and divide that by two. That'll give you your 7,250 feet. And you get to do the same thing with 20 degrees. And then once you get those numbers, then you get to do it again between each other, between 20 degrees and 30 degrees. And then you can do it again to get that number because 27 is pretty much in between 25 and 30. Or you could do, what did somebody say? Round up, round up. Roughly round up. You know what's going to be pretty stinking close to? 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 degrees. Just run with the and 7,000 feet. Just air on the side of the Well, but how close is that going to be to 30 degrees Celsius at 7,000 feet? Really close. So somebody do it and tell me. <laughs> That's how you do it. You know what I did? Create a spreadsheet with all the different variations that I want. You'll do the same thing for that chart. Look at the fuel used numbers. There's a thousand foot difference, and it's only 0.4 gallon difference. So 500 feet is 0.2, 250 feet is 0.1. It really gets minuscule. 
at some point, and you will see, especially with and with same thing with the cruise charts, they're just gonna you'll be rounding up anyways, so we might as well just use the other number. It's gonna get so close. Right? They're not looking for exact, they're just looking for close to. And this is you guys. You're doing this for yourselves. Would you rather calculate you're gonna use more fuel than you think you might, or less fuel? More. More. Because now you're gonna have your endurances could be less, so you'll land with more fuel. You're erring on the side of caution. Better to have it and not need it than not need it, or than not have it and need it. They need it and not have it. So. Again, same thing with the lines here, okay? So we've gone through the takeoff. Let's talk about the climb performance a little bit. Same thing with this one, okay? This is no different than the other one. It's There's no interpolation with this. What you calculate is what you find. The hard part's going to be how exact can you be with this? As you're going, you bet, I mean, if you, unless you're using a ruler, there will be some error. And even then, you're still going to be, these are increments here of about 20. Don't look even either. Or 200, actually. So, yeah, they're not 100% even. It's just getting it close. Who's ever seen mechanical E6B? Who's used it? Can you get decimals on that? Ah, it's just to be close. You're just getting close. We're not looking for perfect calculations on this. Err on the side of caution. Say you're going to, you are burning more fuel than you really think you are. Your performance is going to be less than you think it is. Just always have, you know, be pessimistic in your calculations. Always pessimistic. And then you can't go wrong. This is part of the aeronautical decision making. The risk management. All right. All right. Climb rates. This one's giving us climb rates. The Cessna ones don't. You'll have to actually, there is a climb rate chart in the Cessna's book, okay? I don't know that I've ever seen that be accurate for the flying that I've been doing on any given day. Some days it's less, some days it's more. Like right now, it's off the charts. When I was in Colorado, it was always less. Like I never got anywhere near what that thing said I should be getting on that day. How do you reconcile that? Like, what do you do to get an idea of what you should expect on that day? So, or maybe take the, um, whatever it says from the POH and then bounce that off what you know density altitude has an impact on. Well, is that going to take density and altitude into account? So that isn't. It isn't? It's not true. Why? It's not true. That's not all of uh, density altitude, is it? For what we can calculate, yes. What is density altitude? It's pressure altitude corrected for non-standard temperatures. Now, we can't account for the humidity. Yes, you are 100% correct. And that will definitely affect our <laughs> performance. But we're going to be pretty close. Keep an eye on it. Go fly. See what it does. Have an idea okay it did that this time and write it down keep you know keep track of things like that same thing fuel burns if you really want to find out what that airplane is burning if you know you're doing a good job of leaning the airplane for flights and how much you're flying you're burning for each of the different flights you do say you're doing a couple different you do a talk eating around regularly and you just want to know roughly what the airplane is burning in cruise fill it up you know exactly dip it find out exactly how much fuel you have fly it dip it again see how much burn keep doing that every time you fly that route you'll get a good idea of what you're burning over time. It's the best way. Then you'll know if the POH is close or not. All right. Say we take off out of here, we're going to climb and we want to fly over, uh, we want to we climb up to 2,500 feet by the time we get to Sleeper Strip. It is about five miles away. What is the altitude? Uh, Yeah. So, somebody tell me what the uh, how long it should take us to climb from sea level to 2,500 feet. Three and a half minutes. How much fuel are you going to burn in the climb? Because there's something else that I didn't include on this, but where how I cut it. How many gallons? One gallon. Okay. And for us, we need to add, was it 1.6, Joe? 1.4. 1.4. 1 
Okay. For run up. Plus 1.4 for engine run up, taxi, and takeoff. So we're really burning 2.4 gallons. And how many miles is it going to take? Five miles. Yes, ma'am. 1.1 per taxi. And which one are you looking at? That's an old one. So does it, it does matter because you're not looking at the S model. Your yours is an 81, so I'm, I would assume you're looking at a P model. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it does make a difference because that one also has uh, fuel tanks are 20, 20 gallons in the fuel tanks on that one. 1998 version five. So. Which one do you have, Joe? S. 72. 1998. Okay, there's a five. So, by the time for our climb to 2,500 feet, we should hit our altitude as the restriction, according to the chart. If you take off from here and immediately. If you look under the plan, at the very top, on the top left, it says there's one that has planned heading. It has true course and altitude. Well, you're going to pick an altitude. For that first one, it's going to be departing out of Merrill. If you look here, you got the uh, checkpoints departure, and then on down. That's where you put your waypoints, okay? So the first one's going to be Merrill. Hammer, what, however you want to put it in there, P-A-M-R, or Merrill, or M-R-I, whatever, however you want to annotate that. The next one, if we're flying out here, we select the sleeper strip, so sleeper strip, altitude 2,500. And if you look, as you go across, you have compass heading, then distance, ground speed, time, and fuel. You're going to calculate all that stuff out. So you only have distance, time, and fuel on there for that leg. Well, but we wanted to climb to 4,500. So now on another leg, we're going to have a climb. So guess what we have to do? We have to go back to this. Well, now we're at 25, and we're going to climb to 45. So somebody tell me what, how much fuel we're going to burn getting up to 4,500 feet and from 2,500 and the time and the distance. It would be 0 0.7 fuel, per gallon per fuel. Okay. So 0 0.7 for fuel. What else? How about time? Three and a half minutes. Yep. 3.5 on the minutes. And how far? About five miles. Not about. There's an exact number. Four miles. Four miles. No. So if your leg is from sleeper ship to, say, um, Big Lake, well, that route is going to be 20 some miles. Or, yeah, 20 some miles. The, those calculations, you're going to have a fuel burn that you have to calculate for crews, the time, and um, the distance. All, all the numbers you just calculated here have to be uh, subtracted from that other information because you've already calculated it. So when you go into crews, when you go into this chart, <clears throat> one of the things you have to find if you look on here, this is where the wind correction and stuff comes in. We will be dealing with more of this later, next week, actually. Okay, so don't get too worried, hung up on not understanding this, but one of the things we want to calculate on here, the most important thing is the ground speed, because that's going to dictate how far we can fly, because that's going to how, be how long it takes us to fly with the amount of fuel we have and our fuel burn. So our endurance is predicated on the amount of fuel and our ground speed, our burn rate with the ground speed, okay? This comes into play. So we need to figure out how many gallons per hour and uh, what our ground speed is and everything, all that good stuff, and then how much fuel we're burning. And that's all based off of the distance. So the distance that we calculate on for our climb is taken away from the total distance on that leg. And that's the distance you're using to calculate your cruise portion of it. So you're going to have to do a lot of calculating, and it's a royal pain. So what I would highly recommend is avoid a lot of climbs. 
plant over that pool. You're saying like if you have a long time to get up to a certain altitude. And it's, it's not going to affect it. Okay. Just know that that's going to subtract, and because all together it'll go together. This should still work itself out okay. pretty closely because you're still going to your cruise climb is going to have you at a slower ground speed than overall. But then when you calculate it you're there, you're still going to well. It depends if you're on a cruise climb. What your what's your uh, mixture setting going to be? Because if you're full rich, it's going to be higher. Once you're cruised out, you should be leaned out. So your power, your when you're leaned out. Your gallons per hour is going to be less as your power setting decreases and your property. When you're at a climb, typically we're in a climb at full power or at full mixture, unless you're about 3,000 feet and then you're starting to lean it out. So that's one of those things where you, that's kind of where you want to play that by ear. You could be in a cruise climb as with a lean. There's nothing wrong with that because you're all you're doing is you're allowing the airplane to just climb gradually in a cruise setting. So it could it's still pretty much work itself out. What any other questions? Go ahead. So what determines like a uh, new leg on here? If you change uh, well, so waypoints. Okay, well, we'll talk about that. So don't get hung up on that just yet, because this is gonna be next week where we'll be talking about pilotage, dev reckoning, and flight planning and all that stuff. And that the waypoints is all about pilotage. Okay. So but it's going to be the points that you select on the ground that you will overfly so you know you're on course as you continue on. So say, you know, um, you're flying here, like we said, sleeper strip is going to be a waypoint. You're overflying sleeper strip. You know, hey, we're there. Now I need to turn to a new heading to fly to the next lake, big lake, or whatever you want to use. That's what it is. It's just that part of it. Just finding the next point that you're flying to as you continue your journey to your, to your, to your end. Because you don't want to just try to fly straight to Talkeena. What if your calculations are wrong and your heading takes you way off course? So is there a requirement for distance between? There's a recommendation between 20 and 30 nautical miles. The first one should be roughly about five nautical miles from your airport. So you can see it from the ground. That way, a lot of pilots get lost after takeoff. So you want to have something you can typically see from the ground or something as close. Sleeper strip is perfect. Um, so, but after that, you don't want to have them every like, Five to ten miles because you're constantly going to be looking down doing calculations because that nav log, if you look at it, there's calculations that have to be done. You it says um, estimated and actual ETE and ACE and ATE estimated time and route, actual time and route used and route. So you have the estimated time ground speed and your actual ground speed and estimated time and route and your actual time and route because you want to calculate that stuff out. You want to know how close you are on your flight on your flight. Where the winds were they forecasted was there, did you do a good job were you pretty close to what you forecasted in flight plan and that just helps you as a better makes you a better pilot over time but if you don't do it if you're doing so close you're constantly looking inside what are you not looking at for one you have no idea where you're going because you're not looking making sure you're flying on course two you're not looking for traffic altitude everything you're going to be everything's going to hell while you're writing things down and uh, who's flown and tried to write something down while holding the yoke? <laughs> what happens typically? One of the two is bad. Oh, you turn. So you turn the airplane and kind of get into a descent typically. You will turn the airplane while you're writing something down. If you want to write it down, what do you do? And then look back up. Let go of the yoke. Stable aircraft. Okay. So. What are some of the components on here that you think might be important to you? Well, is this better? No. So that's two. What's this one? Well, what are you going to fly at? Cruise, what RPM setting do you want to fly at? Which is the correct RPM setting to set for a cruise set of one? Anybody else have a different answer besides 2400? On? What's it depend on? Yeah, it's a trade off. Gallons per hour goes up as your RPMs go up. Go down, you know, it's just one of those things. But 
going way slower. 2100 RPMs. You know what that's going to give you at 2000 feet at 2100 RPMs? About 90 knots. That's going to take forever. What if you have a 20 knot headwind? Now what's your ground speed? 70 knots. And you're flying 100 nautical miles. <laughs> what's your resume? <laughs> what's your resume measured at? Hours. <laughs> yeah. Do you really want to spend most of your time just flying from here to there? <laughs> Are you paying for the gas? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the instructor time? Need the hours, though. Okay. Not for your private. You want to try to get the early ones done as quick as you can. You want to get to a paying job, and that's going to be shortening the time frames that you're spending in the air and the money. And then when it's a CFI, no, you want your students to cruise around at 80 knots all the time. Except I don't let you because I don't try to take your money. All right, so RPM is important. The, the reason I ask is you said 24, you said 21, or it depends. It's whatever you Decide. pick an RPM setting. It's up to you guys. There's no wrong answer there, okay? It's what you determine and what you fly plan. You can cruise at 22, 23. It doesn't matter, okay? You have the calculations there. That's the important thing. You know what you're calculating and you are, what you're flight planning for. Fly what you plan for, though. If you said you're going to cruise at 24, cruise at 24. All right? Cruise at the altitude you set. <coughs> All right? So horsepower really doesn't matter. All right? They give you the horsepower. What is What I want you to take a look at, though, is 2,400 RPMs or any. I'm just arbitrarily picking one, okay? 2,400 RPMs at... 20 degrees below standard. Well, what is 20 degrees below standard? What is the temperature at 2,000 feet? What would be 20 degrees below standard? Negative five. Negative five. Okay. Second. Yeah. Because it should be five degrees. No. It should be. Um, yeah. No, it should be. So it's two degrees Celsius for every thousand feet. So four degrees. So 11. Minus nine, right? Minus nine degrees at 2,000 feet. Should we check my math on that? Okay, standard temperature. What's the difference in horsepower? Even 5% of your horsepower just with 20 degree temperature change. Nothing else changed. You're losing horsepower. Let's go higher though. 25 and 25. So we're 65 here. Now, I mean, there's four degrees, uh, four percent, and another. There's uh, another four percent there. If you're 20 degrees above 8,000 feet, you're almost at half your horsepower at 2,400 RPMs. Let's go 2,500. Because typically you're not going to. That was 25. 2,500 RPMs at 8,000 feet at that temperature is going to pretty close to full power. You're pretty close to full power already. And you're only getting 57% of your power at that altitude. So that's how dense the altitude is protecting your airplane. That's the thing to take away from the horsepower. Otherwise, we don't need to use that to calculate anything out. All right? Not to true airspeed, we use that to calculate the ground speed. And the gallons per hour, obviously, we're calculating how much fuel we're planning on burning throughout the flight. So all that stuff is very important. And it's no different than anything else. The interpolation works the same. Because your temperatures are big, big, there's a big difference. So that's 20 degrees. There, I would recommend creating your own check, your own list that has five degree increments. And we got 2,000 foot changes. Well, if you're flying at 2,500 feet, you got a lot of calculating, a lot of interpolating to do. So I highly recommend that you're going to constantly be doing this stuff. And it's going to be similar altitude. So instead of calculating, recalculating every single time, maybe create your own chart that you can just look at. Like, okay, good to go. Make life easier on there. If you're using the book and it's for your reference, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay? All right. Questions on cruise performance and how to read the chart. This is stuff that's going to be on the test. Okay? Endurance. I hate endurance charts. 
what is endurance? Can endurance change from what you what you calculate here? Based on what? What what could change that? Okay. Something way more that will really affect it more than that in flight. Not so much temperature, I mean, it can a little bit, but there's one that has a huge impact on it if it is totally different from <laughs> forecasted. Winds. Winds. Wind will change this because wind affects your ground speed. So you'll have, like here, it says your range profile, how far you can fly, how many nautical miles. That is the dumbest chart. You have to know how to use it, though. All right? And they give you percentages, like power settings, full throttle. 65% power, 55% power, 45% power. That's where the, arc, the percent horsepower can come in and help play with a, you know, you know what setting you're at. can tell you, okay, well, I'm at 2,500, I'm at 68% at 2,600 RPMs at 8,000 feet. Well, now you know which endurance profile you're on. You're around the 65%, so just go over here a little bit. And now you're on it and you just follow the lines up to the altitude you're flying. And um, yeah, it's gonna just it'll tell you your ranges. So altitudes and over the percentages and down will tell you what your range is. Okay. So say we're flying at six thousand feet at about uh, seventy percent power, six thousand feet across right in the middle. <laughs> that looks like so about five hundred twenty-five miles. It says. But again, we've got a headwind. Nope. Definitely don't have that. No matter what, how much power we're flying at, you use power you want. You're not going to go that far. So, what is affecting us is our ground speed. Our ground speed is based on the winds. So, the winds are the only thing that really matter. Our ground speed is all that matters for our, how far and how long we can stay in the air. I really don't like this. Now, this is important, though. This is all about risk management right here. Okay? I. I can't remember if I said this or not. I feel like I did on early on in our um, when we like one of the first couple classes we had together. I said that risk management is kind of is playing a game. Does anybody you guys recall me saying that? Okay. Do you what did I say? What game? The what if game. The what if game. Good. So I did say it. Yeah, risk management is playing the what if game. How do you mitigate risks? Here's a better question. How do you eliminate risks associated with flying? Stay on the ground. You stay on the ground. You don't fly. It's the only way. And even then, you're still at risk because what if an airliner lands on you? That's <laughs> <laughs> it. Associated with aviation, you're flying. But yeah, the only way you can eliminate the risks associated with you going in an airplane is to not go. So we are already accepting some risks associated with flying. All right. The only thing we can do at that point is mitigate risks. How can you? How do you mitigate risks? What's the first thing you have to do with the risk? You have, well, before you can even plan for it, you have to what? Identify. identify it. Well, how can you identify it if you don't know about it? If it's an unknown risk to you, you play a game. What? What if it? Well, what if this happens? Well, what are the risks associated with it? Constantly playing this game as you're doing your flight planning. Because while you're doing your flight planning, what's something you should be considering? An escape route. What's an escape route? An escape route. Yeah. What's an escape route? Exactly. So say you're on the practice area, you're over Big Lake, and you lose your engine. What's an escape route over Big Lake? Where? Well, there's a strip out there. Big Lake is right there. Yeah, the Big Lake strip. What's going to determine if you can make that runway? How high you are and how far you are away from that strip. And what's going to determine how far you can go? You notice that as it goes this way, the higher you are, the further you can go. Now, remember on this, this gives you some things. The speed is 68 knots. Okay? Power is windmilling, zero flaps, and no wind. Good luck. <laughs> You ever experienced a day when there's no wind? I don't know. 
there's always some kind of a little bit of right anytime you hear them say wind calm winds are variable it's just very light hard to read okay but in that situation tailwind is good always good in the air you always want a tailwind it's going to get you there faster and get you further okay so if you have a tailwind it will increase your distance headwind is seriously going to decrease the distance but at that point you are going to go for the best place you can find okay and the only way you're going to tell if you are going to make it there or not because your descent rate is not going to change you will see your sink rate changing okay but the what if game you're going to use that for determining your altitude what if i lose an engine what altitude do i want to be at in cruise higher the better now you start running into winds you want to pick altitudes that coincide with favorable winds you don't want to fly with a 30 knot headwind if you can go 2,000 feet lower and have maybe a 10 knot headwind so but yeah altitude 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 it is life insurance airspeed is life altitude is life insurance so go higher all right we are flying around out there i'd say roughly 2,000 feet agl okay on the practice area, if you're at between 25 and or around 2,500 feet, you're pretty close to 2,000 feet above the ground. How far can you glide? Two and a half miles. Three. It's more than that. Two at 2,000 feet? Three right between them, right? Yeah. About three miles in. Three miles is a pretty good distance. Three miles is a pretty good distance. If you're over Big Lake, you can easily make a big lake. If you're over the actual lake itself, you can make a big lake airport easily. I actually did that to my student today. Guess where he planned to land the airplane? On the lake. <laughs> no. Failure to plan for the flight. He had an idea the big lake airport was out there. He had no idea where it was. He has flown over this area many times. We have flight plans to Talkeetna many times. It's an escape route. Big Lake Airport is a escape route. So is Goose Bay Airport. Wasilla counts as, a, as an out. How about Willow? These are all airports that you can make landings at. Now, Big Lake, Willow, um, Goose Bay, they're all dirt. Do you care if it's dirt? No. 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 It's meant for wheels on an airplane. Put it there. All right? So those are your escape routes. That's that what if game. What if I lose an engine? What if I have... Um, some malfunction what do i do all right so altitude is really good i was flying down to homer with a student we were at 8,500 feet how far could we glide so i'd say about 800 or 8,000 feet above the ground how far could we glide that airplane at 8,000 feet 13, 13, 12, 13. i'd go with just 12 yeah between 12 and 13 so on the probably Air on the side of caution, close to 12 miles. 12 miles, though. Where we were at, we were over, uh, I can't remember where it linked, we were over, I don't think it was Ski Lack. But there was an airport that was like eight miles away we couldn't glide it to. Easily for lost engine that at, at that altitude. That's awesome to be able to do that. And that's what the altitude is there for. If you're on a long trip and you don't care about fuel, you don't care about time, go for it, go higher. Gives you better opportunities. You know, those are your, you are increasing the number of escape routes you have. Because there are all, how many private airports do we have around here? Does anybody have a clue? A lot. A stupid amount. To find around here. Wasilla. Well, hell, how many just out in the practice area, out in the farm fields? There's four that I passed over that I can think of off the top of my head. And that's just in the farm field area. And you've got regular airports. How about over Wasilla and Palmer areas? In that area, insane. And if you're at 8,000 feet in that area, you can land at Palmer or Wasilla if you lose an engine. You can even make Burke trip. So lots of options to hire you <clears throat> Okay. So that's the point of that. That is all part of risk management. Crosswind component. Who's ever used this chart? Okay. Very important for us. So say. Yesterday, I came into land last night. All right, we're going to go with the gust factor, the gusting speed, because that's really the only part that's going to matter. I was landing on runway seven. Winds are out of three four, three four zero, at thirteen. What's the difference between your headings? 
Laws of ion 0, 7, 0. That was my headings. Runway 7 is 0, 7, 0. Winds are 3, 4, 0. So what is the difference there? Yep. So direct crosswind. So what was my crosswind component? 13 knots. I had a 13 knot crosswind last night. It was eight gusting 13. So I had an eight to 13 knot crosswind at any given moment coming in on runway seven. What if you landed on, oh, never mind, doesn't matter. Because the other option would have been to land on three, four. Well, what's the headwind component on that, or crosswind component on that one? Zero. No, it's all headwind. All right? All the flying I did last night is a horrible example because it was all 90 degree crosswinds. Yesterday was a great crossing practicing day. Um, so let's do what is the crossing component if I landed last night and the winds were um, 0 to 0 at 10. Okay, so what we do is we go find 150 degrees. Okay, so we know that this is our line here. All right, so I said 10 knots. Okay. We have 50 degrees, so you're going to start at 10. You're going to follow this arc around to get your 50. You go straight across, it's your headwind component. You go straight down, that's your crosswind component. And that's how that's read. You just got to remember to find the distance here, the difference here. The difference here is going to be, uh, the degrees is going to be the difference between the winds and, your, and the runway you're landing on. That's the part you have to remember to think about. That's the that, the only real calculation you have to do on this, because otherwise it's just knowing how to read it. So let's say we come in and we're landing on runway 25, winds are uh, 280, and they're 20 knots. 280, 20 knots. So there's a 30 degree difference. We got 30 degrees here, 20 knots. What's our headwind? About 17. What's our tailwind? I'm sorry, what's our crosswind? Eight or nine knots. Not terrible. Does anybody know what the limitation on a Cessna 172 is for the crosswind? It's a trick question. There is no limitation. There is a max demonstrated, and it's 15 knot crosswind. So, you have a nine knot crosswind. No big deal. Can you? What limits the amount of crosswind you can do? Okay, skill for one. <laughs> but even if the most skilled pilot will run out of something and make it impossible to do a crosswind landing. If you have too much wind, there's one thing that you will run out of. You will run out of rudder authority. Is all determined what you can do. The amount of crosswind that you are capable of landing that airplane in is all dependent on how much rudder authority you have. You can run out of rudder. So I've got one of our instructors here. He's flying for Raven now that he's flying the Dash 8. I did not realize. So that is a twin engine airplane. There is no um, minimum controllable airspeed on that airplane with one engine. It will not ever run out of rudder. The rudder is so big and so powerful, they will never run out of rudder. So they have no problem with crosswind landings. Because they've got a stupid big rudder that is capable of doing whatever they need. It's all about the rudder. And what determines how much rudder authority you have? Time this back into previous conversations now. Your center of gravity. If your center of gravity is further forward, you have a longer arm between the center of gravity and the rudder. You have more rudder authority. It is it has more leverage. I was full deflection. How'd you feel it? My hands were shaking after I got down, and I called it quits. I was like, "We're done." <laughs> we went up. 
like, ah, we'll be fine in a good day, get some crosswind trading. We did, me, one landing, we called it, because it was ridiculous. I did a go around. It was the first we came down and I, we just got blown up, got gusted up, because it was gusty. Did ground, came in, put it down, and called it quits. No, not today. No, no. no today was fine. My students did all the landings today. So I was almost taking off and they went like super steep. Oh, that was me. Oh, it was? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were doing the departure where I told my student we were doing the shoreline departure. We did a short field takeoff and I wanted to VX the whole way out to the shoreline. But we had, I think it was 2,300 feet by the time we hit the shoreline. Again, Back to the performance, back to understanding the climbs that you want to do, the departures, because the shoreline is not the normal departure. He's used to the inlet. He's almost going to check right. He's about to be a private pilot. He better know how to do this. Fly different departures out of this airport. So he can go rent an airplane at Angel and do whatever the hell he wants. I'm not doing my due diligence as an instructor. <laughs> my students don't know how to fly the airplane in all aspects, not just the UAA. All right, crosswind components. There isn't a, if you notice, all right, 90 degrees, goes beyond a bit, doesn't it? What are we picking up down here? That's your tailwind component. You will land in Merrill with a tailwind, I guarantee it. Because they really don't like changing off the runway 25 unless they really have to. It will typically not do, you won't be landing with too bad of a tailwind. It's not going to affect you too much here. But that's how you can calculate your tailwind. If you know that the winds are 050 and you're taking off on 25, well, what's that component? It's not even on there. 250, 050, that's. Uh, 200 degree difference. So, uh, really, it comes down to 30 degrees. So it's going to be 120. So, say so you're taking off with five knot tailwind, or five knots. Winds are five knots, and you're at 120 degrees. So five. Around 120, right about here. So you're looking at about three knot tailwind. It's not going to hurt you. And it's going to extend you a little bit on your takeoff roll. And typically, the tailwind is actually in the air, not on the surface. So your takeoff roll is going to be fine. It's just going to extend you on your climb out. We do the inlet departure anyways, half the time, most of the time. So. Circling, it doesn't affect your performance at all. And if the winds were bad enough, they would ask you, they will ask you if you what you want to do. So you get you get the opportunity to make those decisions on if you want to take off with the tailwind or not, see how it affects your role and what you're used to seeing. Okay. All right. Think we've discussed that enough today? Any questions? We have covered all the charts for performance, all right? The two different kinds, you'll see the line and the uh, the numbers one where you have to choose interpolation. So the line one, you don't have to do interpolation with the one where they get you, they just give you certain blocks of information and you have to interpolate that. So be aware of that, okay? Uh, there will be, up. we put it posting a test later this week. These ones, I'll put these slides up on for you. Um, is there anything else you guys would like me to post up on there that you, that I've asked you about that you just, you didn't have access to for some reason. Answers to the final. Okay. No question? Yes, sir. You get to all these charts are going to be up on? Yeah, the ones that were on the, the, all the charts I gave you, you guys already have access to. I pulled those directly out of the 172 POH that I posted online in the material section and the diamond ones. So they're all in there. Okay. So you can pull those up and actually look at them now. But yes, the ones that are on the slideshow will be in when I post them. All right, if you don't have any questions, I'm done with you. Okay. Uh,